Thank you for staying to the end. There's a story about a man who was a conference speaker and it what they call the death session after lunch when people are going to sleep. And slowly the people were drifting out of the conference room to get a cup of tea. And eventually this man was making his presentation to a single person that was sitting in the chair in the front. And he walked up to him at the end of the presentation. He said, thank you so much for staying through my presentation. And he said, I had to, I'm the next speaker. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm here is the Bristol Cancer Research Group, who visited South Africa in the 90s. And that was the first time at the University of Advertisement Medical School that a group of medical practitioners came and spoke about three levels of dealing with cancer, body, mind, and spirit. And so it's really interesting to know that that institution has now got a, a different name and it's just up the road there, but that's where I met a neurosurgeon who was a speaker there. And that neurosurgeon was one of these very strange medical types like Stephen Away, who believed that there was another way of looking at the human being, which we're going to look at very briefly. And he was investigating, the piece that he was talking about at this conference, was investigating whether he in fact could measure the subtle electrical field of a human body. And they did strange things. They measured li living people and at night they wouldn't stole cadavers from the fridge and put wires into them to see if they could measure. And that started our conversation going. He and I discovered that we were busy writing the same book. I was writing a book on consciousness as a whole making phenomenon. And he was writing a book on the brain and neurology as a whole making phenomenon. And so we put that together in a book called Holism and Consciousness, which was never published. We couldn't get anybody to look at it. We did write other papers and they can be found on the internet. So the subject that we discovered together was psychoneuroimmunology. Psycho, the psyche, and I'm gonna be talking to what that is briefly. Neuro through the neurological system, through the central nervous system, and then its impact on the immune system. And what does that do in respect of cancer? That name has now become even longer for those of you who like long names. Psychoendoneuroimmunology, because it includes the endocrine system. So, first of all, why the fuss? And I think the fuss has something to do, and that's the fuss of us being here today, something to do with what I call an epistemological impasse, a bit of a clash of worldviews. We know that the, the biomedical model, the model that has been described here so vibrantly today, particularly by the last speaker, is based on a view of the human body as a mechanical system as a material system. And it is that clash that, that sees it as a mechanical system that is based on what uh, one of the previous speakers spoke about as a mechanistic linear straight line cause and effect system that cannot cope with the complexities of the full human being. And so we've now got that versus alternative medicine. And uh, the previous speaker made a very interesting point about that. The alternative tends to have this effect of polarizing. It says it's either this or that. And I want to be one of those that supports this notion of integrative medicine, of, uh, of looking at the whole person. So alternative medicine will include your natural therapies. It will also include this amazing range of bioenergetics the subtle energetic fields, the Chinese approaches that we've heard about today, homeopathic approaches we've heard about today, including all the new smart equipment with quantum machines that radiate you. All of that is starting to operate in a field that cannot be measured clinically in a laboratory. And that's the core problem, the epistemological impasse. So the biomedical model it's been, it's been acknowledged today has achieved enormous things in the developed world. It's given us longer lo longevity, it's addressed 
your infectious diseases is found many, many solutions. I thought I heard an interesting uh, argument today which said maybe it's not so much the biomedical model that uh, gave us these results. Maybe it's in fact our changed lifestyle that we aren't under such stress, physical stress, temperature, all of those things. The interesting question that emerged today is how much of the, of the improved health that we have in the Western world is due to the biomedical model or the fact that we have a different lifestyle. It's an, it's an important question. But it has given us all sorts of advantages and in its research it has identified a number of features which it somehow cannot explain. And so there they are, psychosomatic disease a very, very well-researched phenomenon. But what is that relationship between the psyche and the soma? That, that has remained something of a mystery in the conventional model. It's given us this notion of the placebo effect. We've heard of that today. One of my colleagues in the world of neuro-linguistic programming, which is how we get our minds sorted out, he said, why don't we then sell a drug called placebo? Why don't we register that you get placebo injections because it's clinically proved to work so well. It doesn't explain the placebo effect. It doesn't explain this phenomenon of spontaneous remission. It has the title, the, the, cancer, the cancer tumor disappeared. We don't know why, it's one of those funny things, spontaneous remission. And it doesn't explain hypochondria, what's actually happening there. And in South Africa, we've got a very peculiar phenomenon, it's called the HIV non-progressors. Now, you probably know that South Africa is the country in the world with the highest HIV infection rate. It is a major, major challenge. And yet there's a growing body of people that are HIV positive who are not deteriorating in their health. So the medical model has called them the non-progressors. This is a very strange thing. They're not progressing on to death. And there's a new name that has been given to that, and that's called the, the elite controllers. Now, this isn't the conspiracy that we're talking about between the bankers, the pharmaceutical industry, and the elite controllers is these peculiar people who somehow have the capacity, whilst having the HIV infection, whilst having the entire syndrome, remain fit and healthy. And the research is increasingly showing it's got something to do with, with their attitude to life. So the biomedical model that operates in a linear causality and it's based on the Newtonian mechanistic scientific model and that model has reached its cell by date and in fact reached it quite a while ago already. I'm going to put a little advertisement in for, for a South African that some of you might have heard about. His name was Jan Smuts. I was uh, in London last week, I went to a conference in Westminster Hall on complexity science, and there on Parliament Square is the statue of Jan Smuts. Now he's known best as a politician, as a general. He's not known that he was Chancellor of Cambridge University. Um, but Jan Smuts's claim to fame is he invented the word holism. He wrote the book, Holism and the Evolution in 1926. And he then gave us a foundation for which we can begin to identify what holistic or integrative medicine in fact means. So in his understanding of the emergence of life and being and you and I, he saw it as a progression from what he calls some kind of a nebulous quantum underworld, some energetic, informational, chaotic soup. Out of that would emerge material matter, atoms, subatomic particles, molecules, and all of that kind of stuff. And we then had the material phenomenon, and out of that would then, as it reached greater and greater complexity of relationships, all of those molecules connecting together, it reached a place where it became self-organizing and it became life. So from a nebulous underworld, <laughs> call this the spiritual domain, if you will, call it the quantum soup, if you will, Deepak Chopra's famous expression, the quantum soup, and I had an opportunity to spend 10 minutes on the platform in, with him in South Africa. Out of that emerges the material world, and out of the material world emerges the biological world, 
the living world. And our medical model, the biomedical model, is looking at the material world, chemistry, and the biological world, and how we manipulate into the biological world through that chemistry, through manipulation, through surgery, through radiation, and everything that we've heard today. But out of that biological world, Smith says, emerges another phenomenon. As the biological world increases in complexity, its self-organization becomes self-aware and mind becomes to emerge. You and I as thinking creatures, with ourselves that are thinking creatures as well, as well, the capacity to communicate more and more with our environment and to be able to respond to that environment by choice. And so now we emerge into the world of the psyche, into the world of the mind. But in the biomedical model, that is then cut off and handed over in authority to the psychologists and to the psychiatrists and people like that and the social workers. So there is a schism between the biological world of conventional medicine and the psychological world, There's a, and they don't talk to each other. Even your psychiatrists tend to be predisposed to getting a, some kind of a diagnosis and prescribing psychotropic drugs. But if we were to follow the natural progression of evolution as it described by Smuts, from mind we would go to society, the very way we construct our social ordering. And we've heard today, we've heard very, very potently about how we've constructed our social ordering in such a way that more and more we disempowered more and more we got big organization run by governments and institutions and our capacity to relate to our world is breaking down. So the whole world of social medicine is an important medicine. And from that world, he says, there is another emergent world, which is the invisible world of spirit. Call that world of spirit the world of information energy. And so if we were to follow the evolution of the holistic process, in our approach to medicine, we would see that there's a role for treating the material world, matter. There's a role for chemistry. There's a role for teaching the, treating the biological world with all the interventions that take place there. There is an interface between trying to teach the, to treat the biological world with the right biological stuff. And so the very argument that we heard over and over today about treating the, treating the, the living person with living food isn't that an elegant example of that? And then there's the psychological world. What is the relationship between the mind and between the body? We're going to look at that at the moment. And then there's that world of energy and information, which is the world of Chinese medicine, of the great cycles of life, which is the world of new quantum medical approaches, and you name it all. Acupuncture, all of those things. They all have their place. So... Absolutely, the previous speaker was correct that we want integrative medicine. Let's move on. Galen, who shares my name, Claudius, wrote in 200 about there, he noted that melancholic women tended to manifest breast cancer. So already then, he had noted that there was a connection between the state of the psyche and the state of the physiology, the psychosomatic relationship of this living being. So mind is then part of three key information processing systems in the body. Three immediately identifiable information processing systems. The central nervous system, the brain and the nervous system and all of that that we've heard about. The endocrine system, which is the ductless glands that produce all of the hormones, and the immune system, which is in fact known as the body's natural mechanism for restoring homeostasis. And in my deep research into this matter, I found that those three systems are sharing the same material. The same kind of molecular chemistry that you will find in the immune system, you'll find in the, in the endocrine system, and you'll find in the very neurological system, in the neurotransmitters. They are absolutely, totally integrated. And so we want to then say, how can we work with those then as an integrative system? 
How can we work integratively with the conditions that manifest and we will look at cancer? And certainly the world of bioenergetics is now included in that field. So the primary role of, of psychology, for example, for emotional support in dealing with cancer patients has been the role of, uh, of treating depression. And that's a well-known phenomenon in, in most cancer cases and one understands that very well. There's depression, there's anger, there's frustration, there's blaming that takes place. And the, and the results of being able to give that kind of emotional support to people suffering from cancer is very well validated. But more increasingly, we're finding that there are si significant other benefits that are taking place and that there are physiological changes that are taking place as a result of psychological or emotional interventions. So it is not just helping us to feel better, but the feeling better emotionally is actually changing the physiology. And one of those is research into the reduction in cell numbers when there's been psychotherapy applied, the reduction in cell numbers that are indicating inflammatory processes. So there's real direct medical evidence to show that there is a correlation between body and mind. This research, the most recent has been in the, in the uh, psychosomatic medicine, July of 21 of, that was last year. And so there's marvelous research that says there's a direct link then between what's happening emotionally and what's happening in the cells of the body. The link has been well researched. Ada and Solomon were the first people that coined the word psychoneuroimmunology. Now, I come from a country where the first heart transplant was performed by Dr. Chris Barnard. And you'll remember that great event at Grotesquier Hospital in Cape Town. The major problem with heart transplantation was the fact that there was an immediate tissue rejection. So the, the patient's body, the patient's immune system would say this is a foreign object. And it would go and attack that heart. And so they were working with immunosuppressants. Your best immunosuppressant, of course, is cortisone. So all of your anti-inflammatories are based on cortisone. So, but they were looking for really, really powerful immunosuppressants. And they had developed something called cyclophosphamide. And you know you use little animals to test your, 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 your material on. And so they gave rats cyclophosphamide. And they used saccharine as a marker and also to get the rats to take the stuff. When they gave the rats cyclophosphamide, they found immediately that the rats' general state of health would deteriorate. Within a very, very short period of time, those rats would become susceptible to infection. And within a very short period of time, the rats would start developing tumors. So tumor formation and infections came along with immunosuppressants. Then they had to do some of these tests that you do with the random trials, as we've heard, and they then gave the rats just pure saccharine. And to their astonishment, they found that those rats that had taken the cyclophosphamide sweetened with saccharine, when they gave them pure saccharine, the immune system would go into a state of paralysis and the rats would start developing tumors and become susceptible to infection. A horror story emerged that the immune system is actually a learning part of the natural physiological life form. This is in fact a learning ecology. The entire living organism is not a static fix genetically. It is a learning system. And you and I are changing the very structure of our being today by the very information that we've been absorbing by all of these marvelous speakers that we've, we've been listening to. And so if the immune system could be programmed, and that is clear from the evidence, the argument then said, can we reprogram the immune system? If the way that we actually put the information in, can that be reversed? And so the study of psychoneuroimmunology followed from that. So the key element there is called the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary and, uh, and adrenal axis. The hypothalamus is that part of the brain which is most 
potent in processing the emotional experience that we've got. So it's in the, in the core of the brain under, under the cerebral processes. You get the emotional center, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus lies right next to the master gland, the pituitary gland. So that's the HP part. And they discovered that they, they share fine blood capillaries. So what is happening in the hypothalamus that is influencing the blood that is going through into the pituitary and the pituitary then immediately responds to hypothalamic activity and then by the peculiar information processing and information conducting process of the of the uh, of the, the 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 endocrine system through the although it's ductless it just sends the information by routes that are not yet understood but might have something to do with quantum principles of non-locality. Those of you might have heard about that. And immediately the adrenaline gland is the adrenal glands are activated. So a state of emotion that changes informs the pituitary gland, informs the adrenal glands. And the adrenal glands are known as the fight-flight glands. They actually prepare us to go into battle. Thank goodness for that. But the adrenal glands, their major function will be then to, to get the body into a state of high excitement, to get the heart beating, to get the circulation moving, to get the glucose pumping into the blood, to get the lungs breathing, to oxygenate the blood, and to direct that all to the major mus muscles so that we can get into the flight, fight flight mechanism. If we give this a storyline, the immune system is listening in onto that activity. And the immune system can then be seen as the medical core that has to be mobilized when the army goes to war. And so as soon as the adrenal glands go into a state of activity and we go into a state of adrenaline charge, the immune system goes into a state of high alert and it is going to be mobilizing primarily the cytokines. And the cytokines are going to be cruising around the body to find out where's the injury, where's the wound, where's the invader. And then it will go and <clears throat> constellate on that location as markers, get other marker cells to get their activities going, the immune neuroimmun the immunomodulators, and in will come the appropriate big guns, be that the NK4 cells, the killer cells, the lymphocytes, the macrophages, all of those sorts of things. And so well defined then is the is the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis. Now, the immune system then is going to be changed by alarm responses. And under repeated alarm, alarm responses, the immune system can become destabilized. And so continuous stress is going to destabilize the immune system and continuous alarm responses is going to destabilize it. And sometimes shock responses are going to destabilize the immune system. In the research that's emerging in terms of cancer, and there's lots of literature on this, if they track back sometimes as little as six months prior to diagnosis, they'll find a highly traumatic event, often. There's lots and lots of research about that. The immune system was destabilized. So what is that doing? When it's destabilized, it can go into two routes. It can go into an underfunctioning immunosuppression, or it can go into an overfunction. And so with the destabilization of immunosuppression, what we already saw, we would get vulnerability to infections and tumor formation and so forth. So we've got to look very carefully then at the experience of the patient that is going to be manifesting tumors. There is a role to be identified in the prognosis of tumor formation of the state of shock, the emotional state that has affected the immune system. In the case of auto, autoimmune dysfunction and over, overfunctioning immune system, you will then get all of what you know as your psychosomatic diseases, most of them inflammatory based. And so that is a key marker over there. Otani in 2007 studied what is now called cancer immunology. 
So the, the debate about whether there is a direct link between the immune system and tumor formation is still a controversial subject. But what he showed in his studies that in colorectal cancer that he would actually find that you could see the lymphocytes actually actively engaged in the tumor. So it is the lymphocytes in that particular case that could be mobilized to go and engage with the tumor. And, and my argument would be that it is the function of the immune system to engage with the tumor and to clear that up. And I think that argument has been well presented here today already. So that means that certain conditions of cancer can be attributed to immunosuppression. And we heard today that there are many, many other conditions that also need to be looked at, all sorts of stresses. Now that's me launching a, a volunteer to walk over six meters of red hot coals. Her name is also Van Weyck. I don't know if it says something about the genes that we carry. <laughs> but what we're doing there is those coals, and unfortunately you can't see how brightly they're glowing because this is a flash at night. Those coals are somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees centigrade. That girl has gotten into a high state of energetic focus. And in that state of energetic focus, she is programming the entire physiology not to respond to the heat of the coals under her feet. So she'll come to the other side of six meters of red hot coals and there won't be a blister, there won't be a mark through a particular psychological state that is going to mobilize a highly energetic physiological state that is going to intervene in the normal immune responses, the cytokines, the blistering process, and all of that. Now, the question is, for how long can that last? <laughs> when I facilitate an, an exercise like that, we're working on a very short period of time. Because I know if you're not in the right psychological and emotional state, I know what can happen. I've been there, done that, and my wife has nursed me when I came back from an event with my feet color covered in blisters. <laughs> so there is, a, there is a window for which we can hold that state. The record, 35 meters. 35 meters is the record of people walking over red hot coals. So this is shocking stuff. And, uh, and I'm not sure that I'm going to risk, given what happened in this week, offering this as a therapeutic measure in this part of the world <laughs> in the next couple of weeks or so. Although I know somebody like, uh, like Steve would probably be the first one to want to do it. But what we are seeing, what we are seeing is proof that there is a very, very definite modulation of mental states, emotional states over human physiological responses. And if that is capable of happening, can we mobilize our mental states, in fact, to get us back into a state of wellness, to get us optimally functioning? So what can we do then to be able to create the circumstances in which, we, in which we can handle, for example, or support people that have cancer and any sort of disease. And we've heard it today. We, we can moderate our lifestyle to reduce stresses. And so much of stress is really our attitude towards life, isn't it? Dr. Murray Banks was a comedian and a psychiatrist back in the United States who was called by parents who had a child that was what they thought unhealthily optimistic. He saw the good in every situation, and they thought this was not a realistic way to go through life. So Dr. Murray Banks called him in and said, well, let me test this. What do you think is the worst thing we can do for him? They said, give him a present that might disappoint him. So on his birthday, they had this wonderful box on the dining room table, and he opened it up, and as he opened it up, there was this box of horse manure. And they watched him with great interest. And he said, this is fantastic. This is fantastic. And the parents shook their head in dismay. <laughs> and the doctor said to him, what's fantastic about this? He said, you can't fool me. He said, where there's manure, there's got to be a horse. <laughs> <laughs> so
So developing resilience is key. Des developing resilience is the, is the capacity to come back and to come back and to get up. And one of the interesting features of the whole Totnes Transition Town Initiative is the idea of resilient community. Resilient community can only be created by resilient individuals. We're sharing that resilience, developing a resilient society. But resilience is the capacity to see opportunity even though at the moment things might not look like that. So it is, it is a, the kind of perceptual filters that you're looking at life through. And then we've got to resolve those suppressed emotional responses. And maybe one of the issues in British society is this thing called the stiff upper lip, old chap. <laughs> Your generation and my generation is not supposed to show emotion. The previous speaker, man, he showed the emotion. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we need to resolve those issues. We need to get the stuff that we've suppressed up and out so that we can get the whole psychosomatic relationship. And when I use the word psyche, I'm not just talking about the thoughts in our mind. I'm talking about the total information processing system of the entire being, which includes the physiology. It's just another assemblage of information into a particular material concentration, isn't it? We need to generate positive life expectations and competencies. And we need to create meaning and significance out of the fact that we are here. I, I feel that in a way the event that we experienced this week has kind of raised a new window of opportunity. It's raised a new kind of awareness. It's kind of raised an expectation. It's presented a challenge that you know something, there is another way out of this. And so, so that capacity to look at, at future opportunities and to feel that I can do something about that is enhanced when there's a collective that is engaged in doing that together. The, the mobilized community is a very exciting place to be, as we saw in a very destructive way with what happened up in London not so long ago, unfortunately. So a mobilized community mobilized for creation rather than mobilized for revenge or destruction. So I like to look at it in three, in a, in a, in a, a and this, I'm almost complete now, in a term which I call PSI to the power of three. PSI to the power of three. Psychosomatic integration. Psychosomatic integration, PSI, means that my conscious awareness is now embracing the responsibility for this God-given physiology. And I'm really getting in touch with it. I'm really aware with it. And I'm loving it in the way I exercise it, feed it, where I take it, and whether I have a cell phone in my pocket or not. Because I'm aware of that now. I've got a cell phone in my pocket. Psychosomatic integration to the power of one is really becoming responsible for my own physical being. And everything that we've heard around today ex 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 supports that. Psychosocial integration, PSI to the power of two, is my relationship with myself. Who am I becoming? And how do I fit with my society? And what's my relationship with my significant others? And who are my community that I care for? The previous speaker said this so passionately that I didn't care what happened to others until it was my own son. And when it happened to my own son, I then could extend that into my relationship with others. So there is a psychosocial mobilization. And our, your and my identity are only as good as our relationship with our fellow human being, isn't it? If it is not in relationship with our fellow human being, then it's locked into, again, do I have the status symbols that keep the old system working? So psychosocial integration. And then finally, psychospiritual integration. Now, psychospiritual integration can be seen in terms of the old spooky story, or it can be seen in much newer descriptions of science, of being as a process of energy and information unfolding into this opportunity of us being human and our humanity on its route to greater and greater conscious awareness of the dimensions that enable us to be in the first place, 
And some people will call that God. And some people will, you know, the, the, the great organizing developer. And some people will see that as the quantum domain. So there are various descriptions of the domain of energy and information that in fact constitutes my being in the first place. We've heard it said today that different approaches for different people, we have different codes. And so as we evolve as individuals and as we evolve as societies, we're evolving to a psychospiritual integration as well. And all of those three domains then offer your various therapeutic options for holistic medicine and holistic integration. And so holistic medicine then would embrace all of that. So where I'm registered is as an, a, a practitioner of ethnomedicine. And that's a registration in South Africa. In South Africa, we wouldn't have this problem because traditional healing and the Western biomedical model actually live side by side and the government's not going to let the Western one dominate the other one. How they're going to build that into the anticipated national health system is a major debate at the moment. <laughs> but in the South African context, an African person will go to the conventional medical doctor and then go straight to the witch doctor afterwards. Because you're going to give me that kind of medicine, but that person's going to look after my soul and the ancestral spirits within their belief system, because their belief system is your most powerful thing that you've got to work with. And so ethnic medicine, ethnomedicine is about working within the belief frame of the psyche of your client, of your patient, because that psyche is a function of their long history and the social conditions and the trajectory that we are on as a society. And so finally, here's a quote by an NLP practitioner who is a very, very fine medical doctor, Dr. Vida C. Barron. She said this, most of us physicians have suspected for a long time that the human being is more than what we in medicine call a physical body. We sense that we are a complete energy unit greater than the sum of our parts. The mobilization of this unique and powerful force that we are as human beings is the task of metamedicine. <clears throat> so metamedicine meta then is to mobilize all of those forces. PSI 1, PSI 2, PSI 3. Then she says something that could sound very provocative, but I think it is profound. <clears throat> With the knowledge of the completeness of the unit of life force, which we all are, metamedicine then asserts that individuals should emerge from the disease process more powerful than they were before they became ill. It further contends that the disease process was intended to do that all along. 